Hi, I'm Internet Science Boy and I guess it's good enough Thor Kyle Hill. In my day-to-day -day life as a totally not a supervillain scientist, I look up a lot of weird things on the internet, like the tensile strength of the human colon, patents on baby launchers, and military papers on nuclear weapons. I'm probably on a watch list. Because of this, I take my online privacy very seriously. That's why today's episode is brought to you in part by Surfshark. Surfshark is an award-winning VPN that secures your digital life with top-of-the-line servers that allow for an unlimited number of your devices to connect to the internet without revealing your true location. Hackers, streaming services, social media sites that are ruining democracy, they can't control what you see and do if they don't know where you are because you're using Surfshark VPN to hide your true IP address. As a guy with a facility, you know I like that. Where even am I right now? You'll never find out. If you want to try Surfshark like I am, you can sign up at surfshark.deal/kyle and tell them your boy sent you with the offer code Kyle. You'll get 83% off and three extra months for free. You're welcome. They offer a 30-day money-back guarantee additionally, so there's no risk in trying. And the tensile strength of the human colon is 4.21 psi, by the way. All right, let's see what weirdness we're looking up in today's episode. It's not butts stuff, probably. Oh, hey, thanks for coming in. Uh, yeah, personal office is pretty sparse, but you know what they say, cluttered office, cluttered mind. I was doing some personal experimentation with my own personal brand of liquid nitrogen, don't worry about it, and I didn't even think I was going to show any of you the results. I was just gonna experiment with some different liquid substrates, see what happens on camera, yada, yada, yada. But then I ended up filming maybe the prettiest science I've ever seen in my life. Check this out. Um, uh, yeah. So today, we're gonna dive deep into this phenomenon. What's actually going on? Can we figure it out? Let's do some experimentation of our own and see if you and I can discover something new about what's going on together. Oh, the office door's back that way. Now entering the facility. What we just witnessed is the interaction between liquid nitrogen and gasoline. Now, there are other videos of this interaction on the internet, but none of them feature an actual explanation. Imagine that. So today, because this is so intricate and unbelievably gorgeous to me, we are gonna try our own analysis. And we begin with the obvious. That's the Leidenfrost effect. The Leidenfrost effect is usually the first thing you learn when you learn about liquid nitrogen. It's what happens when an ultra-low boiling point liquid interacts with anything that you would consider a livable temperature. The boiling point of liquid nitrogen is negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit. So if it touches pretty much anything, it's going to instantly boil. This instantaneous boiling creates a barrier of vapor around the liquid, around the droplets, and this allows it to interact without really interacting. For example, if you pour liquid nitrogen on the ground, it will skitter away like the ground is a hot skillet. And it's also why, don't try this at home, you can pour, yes, that's my hand, liquid nitrogen on your hand for just a moment, and the Leidenfrost effect will save you because your hand is so, so much hotter than the liquid nitrogen. Now, the Leidenfrost effect is definitely part of the phenomenon here, but I don't think it's the only part. It can't be because the overall effect here changes with different liquid substrates or the liquid underneath the liquid nitrogen. So, for example, let's try to replicate what we saw with gasoline with water instead. Liquid nitrogen on water is still really, really cool, but do you notice now there isn't a dancing effect where drops are bouncing all around for an extended period of time. Instead, it looks like the droplets are more or less staying in place and actually freezing the water surface. This all gives us a hint that the freezing point of the liquid substrate could have a lot to do with our effect that we observe. And it's true, water and gasoline differ greatly across this variable. Water freezes at zero degrees Celsius and gasoline at negative 40. But water is also significantly different across another property. Oh, we're, we're done. Ooh. Meow indeed. 
Why does an open container of gasoline seem to fill an entire room with its smell so quickly while something like a soda does not? I mean, the gasoline's not a nerd at Comic-Con, am I right? Well, the answer is vapor pressure. Now, when a liquid is at thermal equilibrium with its surrounding environment, at the liquid surface, randomly some particles will be energetic enough to escape the surface. These escaped energetic particles will push on the surrounding air, exerting a pressure vapor pressure, which is dependent on the ambient temperature, the pressure, and the properties of the liquid itself. Now, why gasoline seems to fill up an entire room so quickly as compared to something like water is because the vapor pressure is 27 times higher. This is also why you need to be so careful when you're filling up your gas tank. Vapor gets everywhere very quickly. Like, um, democracy destroying information on Twitter. Another way to think about vapor pressure is the rate of evaporation from the surface. But you should stop using Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, I'll take the tuna with, uh, let's put some rye. How do you keep getting in here? Anyway, to test whether or not vapor pressure really has anything to do with our observed phenomenon, we have to control for the variable of freezing point. Controlling for variables is one of the most important parts of science and experimentation, because if you're changing something about your setup, but you're not controlling for a variable, keeping one variable consistent, you will not be able to tell whether or not a new variable is doing anything when you change your setup. So now instead of water, we are going to be using using vodka, which I just happen to have a lot of. And what's good about vodka is that it has a freezing point similar to gasoline. It's not a perfect fit, but it's close. So now we're controlling for the freezing point variable, but vodka has a vapor pressure similar to water because vodka, or at least the kind that I have a lot of, is mostly water. So if the gasoline vapor pressure is going to do anything, we should be able to see some difference now between the water test and the vodka test. So let's see what happens. Wow. The vodka test might actually be my favorite, but it still doesn't look like our original test, does it? So what is the explanation here? Well, based on my experiments today, I'd formulate some very sciencey sounding speak that sounds something like this. The interaction between a high vapor pressure, low freezing point liquid and a liquid exhibiting the Liebenfrost effect creates an enhanced vapor barrier, allowing the random outgassing of droplets to provide thrust for near frictionless propulsion on the liquid substrate. In other less fancy words, what are we writing an abstract on plus one? <laughs> Some of you get it. The gasoline super high vapor pressure plus the Liebenfrost effect gives this a kind of air hockey table like levitation for the boiling droplets. And because the freezing point of gasoline is so low, they don't freeze the surface and stay in place. Instead, they just thrust around like tiny little rocket ships, just according to geometry. Now, is this an actual effect that we're describing today? I can't be totally sure, but I do think this is the first real attempt at an explanation for what you see going on today and all the other videos of this you see on the internet. Uh, I'll take it. I think I'm pretty close to what's physically going on here. So with that, I'll uh, leave you with some more gorgeous footage. Until next time. Aria, will you uh, recalibrate the chain whip turrets, please?
Now exiting the facility. Thank you so much to the very nerdy staff at the facility for their direct and substantial support in the creation of this here video. Today, especially, I want to recognize research assistant Nathan Carcamo and visiting scholar Trent Stollery. If you want to join the facility, if you want to get your lab coat, get episodes early, talk with me in Discord, give me episode ideas, see behind the scenes photos and videos, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill and get on the facility staff today. And if you support us just enough, you get your name on Aria here each and every week. And as you can see, there's literally hundreds of you, so I have no idea how I'm going to pet. There's probably one other part going on here. So there's this beautiful, uh, almost ocean mist-like vapor above all these liquid substrates. And I think even it, it's the smallest part of the effect because uh, the liquid nitrogen vapor, it's so cold, it stays low to the ground, kind of like a fog machine, so it stays on the top. But there's probably also some cooling of the air immediately above. And when you have something with a high vapor pressure and you cool it way down, then you can get this condensation and you can get these trails of condensation. Uh, and this is the exact same thing that we saw in our cloud chamber that we made when you cool down a uh, very, very high vapor pressure alcohol and you cool it way down and it forms vapor. And so I think that's probably the last bit of what's going on. I, I, I mean, if you want to name the effect after me, I'm not going to stop you, you know? Thanks for watching.